We made this. Hello and welcome to Chucky Vision, the podcast here on the We Made This Podcast Network about child's play and Chucky, the whole damn franchise. My name is Mark Adams and I am your host and with me at this time is my co-host Dev Elson. Hello Dev. How are you all doing? (laughs) We are on episode two which means we're looking at child's play two and we're gonna have a Rundown of all of our thoughts on that film. And um, I'll just quickly go through some of the basic information. It came out in 1990. It had a 15 rating in the UK. And it ran for another tight one hour and 20 minutes. I was expecting it to be a bit longer because it was a sequel. Or am I just being weird? Yeah, you could have added that. But yeah, uh, we... Uh, given that we're going to cover, well, we're going to cover Child's Play Three right after this, but uh, yeah, yeah, God, these first three movies, and I don't know, I don't know how long Bright is, but God, these first three movies are very lean. <laughs> yeah, and you know, I think back in the eighties and nineties, that was kind of the norm. It wasn't always epic three and a half hour shit, and um, I kind of like that these films are tight. Yeah, they definitely. I definitely think it plays to their advantage because, I mean, as we'll get into it, I think like a lot of the characters in this are not basic, but like as I say, like very straightforward, and you know they serve their part, and the actors you know bring mm. something to it. Whereas I feel like these movies now, I mean, we can look at the Child's Play, not as a knock against the Child's Play remake, but like the characters feel more defined in an obvious like screenwriting right. way. Whereas I guess they are in this because they're just serving, you know, the narrative purposes. But what I mean is that, you know, there's no waffling scenes, you know, this is a Chucky film and they stick to Chucky doing what he does very tightly. Yeah. I also think perhaps, having done a little bit of research, and by research, what I mean is I read fucking Wikipedia. (laughs) Um, There was a cut scene at the beginning, which they just got rid of. And it was a courtroom scene where Karen was actually sentenced to a mental institution. And that was reduced to one line. Yeah, that does ring a bell. And as we said before, Child's Play, the original Tom Holland cut was two hours. So these movies were technically longer. They just got cut down like in the editing process which i I think works i think definitely works in its favor and i think that cut scene would have been pretty brutal really when you think about it it's you know it's a standard slasher in a lot of ways and it's comedy in a lot of ways i mean not quite bride of chucky comedy but there's definitely an element of comedy to it and the tone of someone who was innocent being convicted and even being sent somewhere where she clearly didn't deserve to go because she wasn't mentally unwell. That was pretty grim when you think about it. It is. And that tone, that aspect does, uh, it flares up throughout the franchise. I think Mancini is aware of that. Like they definitely wanted to avoid that in the first ones because I mean, all three endings are for the child's play films the first three endings are so abrupt, like, well, we kill Chucky, that's it, the end. (laughs) Because they don't want want to dwell on the fact that there is no uh, credible, like, uh, culprit for these murders. (laughs) Like, right right after the ending, no one is going to believe these people that a doll killed everyone. Yeah, 
<laughs> and that yeah, that and aspect that... plays up in the actual plots of the light ones. Yeah, and I think it's um that that is a little bit samey, let's be honest. And I think that was some of the criticisms of Child's Play 3, which we'll obviously get into next week. But um yeah, it can be considered a little bit samey. It doesn't bother me. I really like even Child's Play 3, I'm kind of fond of. But I can see why it needed kind of an injection of adrenaline with something like Bride. Yeah, I think Child's Play 2 works because, as we said, it was two years after the first film. That's enough time to get the creative juices flowing again. That's enough time to think of ideas and stuff. I mean, you know, it's still kind of, you know, the same movie. But, I mean... There's some creativity going on, whereas Child's Play 3 was made nine months after, and that is just no time to, like... Yeah. That's no time to be creative, and it really is, like, you know, a knock against that film that it it's incredibly samey, with not a lot to offer. Mm. Whereas Child's mm. Play 2, I think, you know, even though... I don't know how much more it has to offer uh, from that you didn't get in the first film... But it is as entertaining as the first film. I think so. And I think there's an element of confidence in everybody knowing who and what Chucky is. The mystery is essentially gone. And so Chucky's there being murderous really early on compared to taking about 30 minutes into the first film where it was all a little bit more sinister and is the doll alive, etc., etc. Yes, it's uh, definitely a different fi- uh, film from the first one because, of, yeah, as you say, a lot of the first film is whether or not... Like, well, I mean, even though the film very obviously sets it up that the doll is possessed, you know, it takes a while for... Yeah. It takes a while for Brad Dorff to arrive, whereas in this Indeed. one, he's, you know, he's killing people within, like, ten minutes. Yeah, exactly that. And um, what I find fascinating is that you, you touched on it. It Not only was it released two years later, it was set two years later as well. And I wonder if that was coincidence or actually deliberate. Yeah, I think um, two years is a good enough time to move things on. I mean, I don't think it plays such a huge part in it. I remember like the Friday the 13th films, very arbitrarily, they'll put out they'll put out a film like, the next uh, year, but like in continuity, they'll be like, "Oh yeah, those murders happened like ten years ago," and then mm. <laughs> suddenly this movie made in the eighties is now set in the nineties, and it doesn't ever acknowledge that. <laughs> where, <laughs> and they kind of do that with Child Play Three, where that jumps forward a little bit. We'll see with a, a more yeah. kind of Andy. I think with the two year mm. gap, Andy is still kind of just Andy from the first one in this. <laughs> yeah, he hasn't really grown up very much, has he? He's looks very similar. He's a little more not mature, but he's a little more confident with uh Chucky. I feel like, you know, in the first one he was very much just terrified that whole uh finale. And you know, and then he mm. burns him to death. Whereas in this he's you know, he doesn't have like and it, you know, he has Kyle, but she doesn't really join the fray actively until like Act Three. Um, he doesn't yeah. have he doesn't have anyone like his mother to like be on his side, so he is more independent in this, I guess. Yeah, I think the character development of Andy is just about right. He's not a completely different character because he doesn't really look old enough to be very much more mature. But yeah, I think they get the character development right with Andy. Yeah, it's. I dare say Saul, because I mean, these, yeah, this is a Chucky movie. It's not exactly Saul, but like, <laughs> okay. there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a slight difference in his character. But again, that's the same aspect of Child's Play Two in general. Is that it's slightly different than Child's Play One, but that is, yeah, it's still good. Yeah, and um, looking at the uh, the figures, it had a 13 million budget. And it had a 35.8 million box office, which is another hit, as far as I know. I think that's considered a hit if you double it, isn't it? Yeah, it's not too bad. Yeah, I mean, I imagine, yeah, that is the thing that people tend to do. They You double the budget for the uh, marketing and stuff. I don't know if they would have completely doubled it, but yeah, uh, Jail's Play at this point would have been quite popular. 
So mm. yeah, it did all right. I mean, it definitely did good enough that they uh, rushed out another sequel. Yeah, and I think that's it, isn't it? They rushed out another sequel. And we'll talk about that next week. I looked up the Rotten Tomatoes score, and Child's Play 2 only has 40% on Rotten Tomatoes, compared to 71 for Child's Play. That's actually quite a drop. Do you think that's fair? I think what we were getting at was, uh, yeah, the distinction between the suspense of the first one. I feel like there is definitely less suspense in this. Like, the whole, there's a big part of Child's Play of us going, you know, we're close to the protagonist of Karen and going through this and her relationship with her son. And there is, you know, substance there. Whereas in Child's, you know, whereas the, the, you know, like the foster parents in Child's Play 2, at no point does it matter whether or not they believe in Andy. Do you know what I mean? Right. Like, they, and, True. you know, as, as much as I like the character of Kyle, you know, there's no uh, drama or conflict between her not believing Andy. She just finds out near the end. And again, like in Child's Play 1, you know, when uh, uh, Maggie, the, you know, Karen's friend, goes flying out the window, you know, the uh, the cop lightly suspects it might have been Andy. You know, there's there's conflict. Yeah. There's there's suspense that the blame may be put on this little boy. And I think all quite a few of the kills in this are a bit too disconnected. You know, we'll get to some of the kills in more detail, but like the school teacher, I don't think anyone actually ever finds the school teacher dead. So there's no connection to you yeah. know there's no blame on Andy like events just events in this movie just seem to happen yeah no one seems to care about the school teacher <laughs> good point so last week i complained that Brad Dourif was the star and he wasn't billed as such so i was looking for that in this particular film at the start and I'm happy enough. He gets kind of like the almost important guest star edition where it says, and Brad Dourif as the voice of Chucky. And I think that's acceptable to me. That is acceptable. Yeah, I think definitely coming right off the first film, I think, I imagine the studio or something were like, no, no, Andy, Andy is the main character. Whereas it would take a couple mm. more films for people to be like, uh, you know, I mean, even though everyone was watching it for Chucky, the studio would be like, no, no, like, you know, it's a human character. It's, you know, yeah. it's, a, it's a story. Whereas it would take, you know, until Bride for the studio to be fully like, yeah, okay, you guys are watching it for Chucky. <laughs> yeah, I, I wonder, it's been a while since I've watched any of these films. I'm watching them again as we go. And I, I wonder whether it will be Bride where he actually gets top billing but um, I think, and Brad Dourif as the voice of Chucky, is kind of like, you know, and Peter Dinklage as Tyrion Lannister. You know, everyone knows that Peter Dinklage is the fucking star, but they're putting him as an and for the egos of other people. Yeah, it, it's clearly something that Hollywood's done, and that's quite a prestigious kind of thing to be, the and someone as someone. Yeah, and the fact that we get Brad Dourif, like, really on, in fact, yeah, that whole prologue happens before we even meet Andy. So we get Chucky before Andy. Yeah. That's definitely, a, you know, them leaning more heavily on on Chucky as the star, as the co-star. Yeah, and I, th- I think the the very first scenes are quite striking. You know, the burnt doll and the image of the eye, and they can get away with so much more because it's a doll. But imagine if that was like a human <laughs> and then it's a weird ass kind of loophole body horror that still wigged me out quite a lot. It is. Yeah. There's some very strong visuals right from the opening in the credits. They're, uh, they're very good though. It's, <laughs> it's a little odd, the whole uh, voodoo science behind it that <laughs> they rebuild his, but I mean, what, was he dead and then he came back to life or was he always a little bit alive and then they rebuilt him and then like it seems like the electricity brings him back but that also seems like i don't know if he's causing that or that was an accident 
Ah, horror films and electricity. It's all a bit like Doctor Who, wibbly wobbly, timey wimey, isn't it? Do we yeah. actually <laughs> need a decent law that's watertight, or do we just want to have a nice fucking stabby smuck stab thing? <laughs> Precisely. Although th- that always kind of confused me because it was like, you know, Chucky usually you know he stabs and he pummels people, but. Like the guy, the the first kill is a man getting electrocuted by the machine, and he flies backwards through mm. a window all dramatically. And it's like, did Chucky mean to do that, or is Chucky so evil that he's just incidentally killing people now? <laughs> I mean, I'm all about a cheeky defenestration, and I like getting to say the word defenestration <laughs> as well. And um, yeah, I, I think it's implied that that is the resurrection of Chucky, and that the the amount of power required is what causes. The defenestration. Yeah, yeah, no, but no, it's a great, it's a uh, a great opening as a my, you know, it flies through the uh, exposition, and God, isn't I just thought, isn't this weird? Because we'll get to it in Charles Play Three. Is it not weird that when you were talking about that cut scene, that the protagonists of Charles Play One, you know, sort of the lead actors were Karen and then the cop played by Chris Randon. Isn't it weird yeah. that the fucking random CEO of Playpal Company is in more films than those characters? Yeah, <laughs> that is a bit odd. And he's still, you know, it, that, 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 yeah, I'm, I'm hoping we'll see Karen in Chucky, actually. Hopefully in some capacity. I mean, we always see that, that headshot of the actress, Catherine. <laughs> we always see that yes. in some of the later films. Like as a reference, but then, yeah, it's just strange. It's strange how these films focus so much on the the company, like the the good guy doll company, because we get more of this Mister Sullivan character in the se- the next sequel as well, and then yeah, after after these, when it focuses more on Chucky, really, you only get a couple references to like, oh yeah, that was a that that, that company back in the eighties. Like it seemed, it seemed like it, it seemed like in the jump to bride that company just completely shut down. I think it's just like simple but cynical, anti big corporation stuff that we have had since the eighties. I think that's actually even ramped up even more in the twenty twenties. Everyone seems to hate big companies and then order shit from Amazon. Yeah, that is a it's a big point in the. Uh... The remake of Child's Play, uh, it's not the Play Balcoms, it's the Kazlan company. And they do, mm. they're sort of like Google, and they do like all like the, right. uh, you know, like the Amazon Echoes, and you know, you can talk to your mm. TV and your computer mm. and stuff. So Chucky mm. is like, now he's got like Wi Fi in him, so he's sort of connected to all your other devices in the house and stuff. So it's Ooh. more direct, it's more directly the company's fault this time, whereas, yeah the company in this just gets the blame for something that's not really their fault at all. I mean, they are bad guys, but yeah, it's not actually their fault. I like that. And do you know what? The more you talk about this remake, the more I think I'm actually <laughs> going to enjoy it. I feel like, yeah, the remake, I feel like it d- definitely plays off some aspects of this. Because as I say, yeah, the company in this, the company shows up a lot in this film, way more than it did in the first one. I do find it weird that Andy lived in the city and then in this mm. one, now without his mother, he's like in an orphanage, like just outside of the city. But <laughs> for some reason, <laughs> and his character of all, the person that blames, uh, you know, all these murders on a doll, they put him in an orphanage that seems to be situated right down the street from a, a doll factory. <laughs> <laughs> there is a lot of coincidence in all of the Chucky films, I think. And... It's a horror film. I don't expect it to be perfect, but yeah, you're absolutely right. This traumatised child, not only does he live near this fucking factory of the doll that traumatised him, there's also a doll in the house and doll, doll, doll. They're driving out of the orphanage and this isn't even related to Chucky, but the dad just isn't looking where he's going and almost drives into a truck of a good guy to a truck and there's just a yeah. massive picture of like the good guy doll staring down at Andy and I wonder whether this is actual deliberate commentary on corporate stuff and how uh, things are thrown into your face and like almost the inevitability of commercialized products or whether it's just <laughs> horror film let's torture this poor child maybe a bit of both maybe 
I mean, yeah, it's a good point. I mean, there's definitely something to it. I mean, yeah, like, it makes sense that, you know, this is, you know, this is a massive company. Like, it's not going anywhere. Like, so you kind of have to, to, you know, face it. Yeah. You know, if Chucky was uh, a celebrity, like, even if you try to cancel him, he's still in, (laughs) he's still in movies and TVs and uh, shows and stuff that you're going to have to watch. Yeah. (laughs) The Chucky to Andy is like, you know, he's like Kevin Spacey. <laughs> it's like, you can cancel him, yeah. but then, you know, you're watching something like Baby Driver, and it's like, oh, he's still there. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that that is a wonderfully bleak modern comparison, <laughs> Dev. But yes, yes, I guess the, the, there is mo- kind of sense in your arguments, even if I don't like it. <laughs> yeah, just to be clear, I'm not saying Chucky's as bad as Kevin Spacey. Chucky's still fine. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Love that. <laughs> Absolutely love that. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to move on. And um, do you know what? I really fucking love what the 90s thought a bad girl was. Kyle's look is everything. <laughs> fucking leather, pop music, <laughs> cigarettes and short hair. She's 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 great. I think she's fucking great. She's honestly amazing. And lo- yeah, looking at Mansion is a gay creator, like, there's definitely... A real sense of style and like personality to her. And I feel like yeah. she's, you know, even though she's a good guy, she's sort of like an early prototype of like what sort of like Tiffany would become. Do you know what I mean? Like this really strong yeah. sort of like this really strong sort of like punk, cool female character. Yeah. I think for me, the comparison I would make, and I don't know whether you're old enough to even remember this character. <laughs> But it was when, like, 80s and 90s were trying to have young people in various TV shows and and films as this cool, new, modern... I'm not going to say spunky. What am I going to say? <laughs> um, kind of feisty female characters. And the first one of those I remember is a character called Ace from I, Doctor Who. God, I should have called you out. I was going to say, are you going to reference Ace from Doctor Who? <laughs> <laughs> I remember Ace. You yeah. can see the comparison, right? Yeah, I can see. Yeah, it's definitely there, and it it remind. Oh, for some reason, it reminded me of the um, Friday the Thirteenth Part Five, which was when they were like really just starting to turn the characters, not even into like stereotypes. They're mm. just like, here's this goth girl, and she has like two tone hair, and she's doing like the robot and stuff. There's like nothing more to her character. She's just that yep. image, and. I am going to do a massive tangent here. Don't care. <laughs> if we've made it quite clear that you and I love all horror. Were you really pissed off that the goth girl in Dream Warriors had the shittest power? I'm trying to remember exactly what her power... I mean, she, she was... Exactly. She, she had some she's, fucking knives. She's, she's bad. <laughs> she's bad and <laughs> she's beautiful. And she has like two knives. And then... Yeah. There, there was like the guy with super strength. There was the fucking wizard. And she just had a new hairdo and some flick knives. Fuck that. <laughs> what the fuck? I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, already, Freddy already has you outnumbered on knives. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know how many knives he has. <laughs> yeah, she got the fucking bum deal, even if she did look the most badass. Uh, but, I mean, if you want to go, I mean, we might jump around here, what, what, what with the character of Kyle. But, like, yeah, if you want to talk about disappointments... God, it's kind of a fucking disappointment that Kyle... Kyle does such a good job near the end of this movie, and then mm. she is just not in Child's Play 3 at all. No, no, she's not. And that's... that. I think that's, like, a major, like, disappointment for, like, rushing the sequel out, because it's like, she could have been in the sequel, and it could have been her and Andy, and then it's yeah. just... I mean, we'll get we'll get to it, but there's a yeah, there's another female character in Charles Play Free, but she, she just doesn't hold candle to Kyle at all. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad that she does come back, but she is conspicuous by her absence from Charles Play Three. You're absolutely right. And again, it's that kind of abrupt ending because it's like, yeah, they would, they they would, you know, they've got no foster parents, and she wants to be independent, so they would just like I don't know, like go on the road together or something, you know, like look out for each other. <laughs> And we literally know nothing about what happened to her or indeed really what happened to Andy for those eight years. And do we need to? Uh, do we? <laughs> yeah, I don't know if we 
we do need to, but I mean, yeah, I mean, I think that's a, it's a strength of Charles. It's a strength of this film that you know it builds not deep characters, but it builds memorable characters that you want to see more of. Yeah, and I think a lot of the cast in this are fun and decent. The two parents, yeah, like, I forget the mother's name, but the two parents, you know, Garrett Graham as the the dad in this, they're you know they're nice. I find it weird that for a film like this that you would the dad is sort of an asshole, but it's not like comical or over the top. He's sort of reasonable. No. He's reasonably cautious of Andy. And so both yeah. of these foster parents are just sort of nice. Yeah, I think it isn't overly hammy, but he does need to be a bit of a, a bell end. And yeah, I think you're right. I think they get the balance right with him. He's just trying to protect his wife. Yeah, I felt I, I felt, you know, not not like a sadness when he dies, but like you know, he, he's not like shouting at Andy or anything. He's just trying to put a game to put a knife down. And I find in that sequence, the really sudden turn is when he dies, and then the mother just completely turns on Andy and just throws her at the house. Does make sense though. I think <laughs> grief can be a weird ass thing, and you know, I've recently lost my mum, and my emotions are all over the place. Sometimes I'm just the weirdest thing will set me off. And then I'll do something that reminds me of her that will make me happy because I've got those memories. And I I think the initial shock of when, when she died, it's a cliche, but these fucking stages of grief are a thing and anger is one of them. And I absolutely think that, for something as an in inverted commas shallow as a horror film, I actually thought they got grief and shock pretty right there. It makes nice people temporarily bad, you know. Yeah, that's you know that's a that's a that's a good nuanced uh, reaction to it. I think yeah, I'd have to agree that's pretty true. I, and I feel like if like the first film that really stuck close to Karen and her bond with Andy. I feel like if they had explored this a bit more, then I feel like Child's Play 2 would have held up like mm. critically alongside the first one. I think that's why fans enjoy Child's Play 2 and why critics were like you know, it, uh, I think I feel like a lot of cr- critics were probably like this is a missed opportunity. It's not as good as the first one. Whereas I think we're, I think we're more generous in thinking like, oh, they, uh, they, they almost had it. They could have, they could have had it. I'm a little bit salty about forty percent. I absolutely get it's not as good as the first one, but it's pretty fucking close. I don't think it deserves to lose thirty percent. I'd have been happy with maybe fifty-five, sixty. I yeah, as we said, as you said about the length of the films, I think it's a benefit that it's more straightforward. It's not to say dumbed down, but it's more, you know, it's just more straightforward and to the point which is a good thing i think yeah and i think it's probably fair to maybe suggest that it lost some of its critical acclaim by being less suspenseful you see the doll basically immediately Mm. but for me i think seeing the doll on the car phone it's a very different way of approaching the story with an established bad guy that we all know is real and I think that's quite sophisticated. We all know the situation. I think it would have been hokey to have tried to have done the suspenseful style that they did in the first one. And I was really creeped out by him just sat there casually on a car phone going <laughs> and chatting, you know? Yeah, it definitely, um, the effects in this are quite a bit more improved. And I remember, I've read that the director, John Lafayette, who was the screenwriter in the first one, and he stepped up to direct this. Yeah, he definitely pushed for more of the effects on screen. And John Lafayette definitely leaned more heavily on the uh, the the tech, the the tech, you know, the the robot version of Chucky in this. Because I remember yeah. Ed, Ed Gale, the uh, actor who body doubled for Chucky in the first film, he was in that quite a bit. And I find some of those scenes where he's moving around are quite scary. But um, yes. John Lafayette said he'd never liked the look of that. It looked just 
too much like a child and he wanted it to look a bit robotic and more doll like so okay and it's a shame that you know he's not in the the sequels as much because i do like that effect the more you see of him of chucky i think they do a tremendous job at the the, all the animatronics and stuff he feels a lot yeah he feels very real in this yeah i think what they get really really right is the difference between the kind of resting face of the standard doll and then how much more evil it is when Chucky's talking. There's there's some real kind of almost hatred portrayed in the way the, the animatronics can talk the doll's face. The, yeah, I mean, as I say, like when they had to do full body shots, they used Gale. And in this, they actually, you know, could have the animatronics you know, legs from feet to head. They could mm. have that on screen walking and, you know, it looked quite menacing. You know, it was very believable. Yeah. And I think the combination of the improvement of the animatronics and Brad Dourif's clear, utter glee that he portrays in the evil of Chucky and Chucky loves being a bastard. <laughs> and I just, yeah, the combination it's just so good. Yeah, I laughed. For, uh, I laughed quite hard when Chucky replace Ch- uh, Chucky replaces the Tommy doll in the in the uh, Foster House, and there's just a shot of him burying the Tommy doll and just laughing so hard, yep. <laughs> just burying him. Yep, is this a real kind of gleeful malevolence? to the combination of Brad Dourif and the animatronics that I think is just excellent. It, yeah. It, and again, I don't know if it's something that reviewers picked up on, but maybe it's just, it's it's sort of at an odd point where Chucky, the character, would revel in being a doll and getting away with all these murders, whereas yeah, it's, it is sort of at a narrative conflict where... He seems to enjoy being Chucky so much, but at the same time is so committed to becoming Andy. Yeah, and I wonder whether that's something they could have explored a little more. The kind almost a conflicted nature to so I've got this element that's advantageous to me, but I'm not human. What do I do? But maybe that's a bit complex for Chucky's franchise, <laughs> maybe. Yeah, I I think they reference it. In one of the later ones, Chucky becoming a human again. But like, yeah, I don't know how much of a smart plan it is to go into the body of this child when you have surrounded this child with dead bodies that make it look like he is the culprit. Good point. (laughs) No one said Chucky was clever. (laughs) That's why these movies end so abruptly, because like... The, the the editors and the directors can't give you uh, can't give the audience any time to think about the plot because <laughs> Chucky's motivations don't make much sense. Chucky does not flee. Chucky is actually insanely brave when he's in a real fucking shitstorm and he should run away and lick his wounds. He just goes in fucking full force, doesn't he? And I love that the character is flawed. I think to some extent you will I- ignore the characterization of the doll because he is just supposed to be an evil doll that stabs people in a very shallow way to a lot of people. But Charles Lee Ray is a fucking idiot. <laughs> and he's always been portrayed as an idiot. He's vindictive. He is d- a danger to himself with his own anger and hatred and lack of logic when it comes to a lot of things. But he's a malevolent and quite creatively cruel force that can't be ignored and i think people don't really look at the characterization the rich characterization of who charles lee ray is because he's in this doll yeah that's a very good point i think there is more to him than i think the other killers i mean he is quite similar to like freddy krueger but again for Freddy Krueger has like a personality, but like, you know, even when he's like, well, you can't kill me because I'm just going to go back to the dream world and I'll just come back again. Even that is a little bit more straightforward. But yeah, like here it's like, you know, even if Chucky does get blown up or melted or set on fire, you know, he doesn't know when he's mm. going to come back. So 
Yeah, as you say, he's kind of, you know, he's he's not a genius. It never specifies that he's like an evil genius. No. He's just relishing in the moment, really. Well, the reality is he got caught, so he's not that good a criminal. <laughs> and he's reckless. Yeah, that's the thing. He is reckless, yeah. I'm going to move on. Um, I had a massive holy shit moment watching this film because, you know, we live in 2021. And there was a teenage character in this film just casually smoking a cigarette like it was okay. And <laughs> I was like, oh, what? <laughs> Holy shit. And I, maybe that says a lot about me and modern society, that there's some elaborate gory deaths in this film. But the thing that popped me the most, and I was like, oh, what? <laughs> was that there was this 15-year-old, I think Kyle was supposed to be 15 or 16, wasn't she? Yeah, that that sounds right, yeah. Yeah, and they have this 15-year-old just <laughs> having a cig, like it's normal, and I was like, what? And let's not forget, Andy takes a puff as well, in one thing. I know, right? And that's what... But, oh, he's like, that was an actual child. I'm, I'm presuming that Christina Elise was actually of legal age to smoke cigarettes. Alex Vincent definitely wasn't. And he definitely <laughs> took a drag of that fucking fag. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, it's 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 it feels like it's going to be set up for something. Like, do you know, like Chucky is going to be covered in like kerosene or something at the end of the movie, and then yeah, Andy is going to flick his cigarette <laughs> before right after ta- <laughs> right after ta- <laughs> right after taking a cool drag, he's going to be like, see ya, and like flicks the cigarette, but. No, it never comes up. It's just a weird little bonding yeah. moment between them, smoking a cigarette. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's not depicted on the screen. But a lot of kids fucking do that. They still yeah. do that. I did that when I was 12, and it was a terrible idea. I coughed and didn't impress the girl I was trying to impress. Does It, it don't matter. She was a girl. They're not for me anymore. And, uh, yeah, everyone's fucking done it. No, yeah, I think that is an element where, like, you know, like the, you know, um, the way smoking is in society, it's re- like heavily cut down in on screen. Almost no one smokes unless they're like yeah. a badass. But like, yeah, it is. A, it's a part of like growing up and stuff. Even if like you don't smoke later, then you know you probably smoked growing up. And I think that's. It's not a big moment in his character, but I think it's a nice little moment in Andy's character that he has this unhealthy maturity of you know having to cope with all this trauma. But you know, and then he gets yeah. he, he gets he, he gets these little moments with like Kyle as an older sister, where it's like he's maturing in a in a more healthy way. Yeah, and I think the scene was like you say supposed to be kind of like a rites of passage, but they would have found another way to do it if this was made. <laughs> In 2021. So I want to talk about the cleverness and awareness of the franchise already. And we're only on the second film. There was a wonderful bit where they absolutely did a nod to one of the biggest moments of the previous film, where they played on the idea of opening the back of Chucky to check if the batteries are in. And on this occasion, they were. And I was like, oh, that's good. That's really fucking good. This really dramatic moment from the first film is kind of shat on, but in a really <laughs> cool way. Yeah, no, that is. A, that, yeah, that, that was a really good callback. That was a really clever comeback. Though I'm thinking, like, was Andy there for that scene? Like, would Andy check the batteries? No, but I think as a kind of callback it works so well because you're expecting the batteries to be missing and when they're not it's almost like Chucky has learned from the first time and I think that's cool I think it's a really nice little touch that plays with it and I'm all for stuff like that yeah no that uh, that was a good little moment I wonder if the the batteries do anything to Chucky like his physiology do they make him do they make him more energized I don't think they've ever explored that, but that could have been something fun and interesting, couldn't it? That, yeah, he's stronger when he's got batteries in or something like that, you know? Yeah, the Duracell missed out on uh, teaming him up with the the Energizer Bunny. 
Uh, uh, yeah, I, I think they should probably stick with the Energizer Bunny Dale. <laughs> you can just keep killing and killing and killing. <laughs> I'm not sure that's the image I want to portray. <laughs> oh, dear. So, right. And I get it, and I know it's a thing, but I do get cross with Americans and their gigantic fucking houses. The basement is <laughs> bigger than flat bastards. Their basement <laughs> is just gigantic. Imagine having a flat that size. Yeah, <laughs> about, yeah. American houses are... I always laugh at them. When, like, it's not as noticeable in TV shows and stuff because it's usually like sets and stuff. But I always find it weird when you see like an Instagram video of someone and it's like their house is their just their room is just massive and it's like you've got so much empty space. Like you don't need a room yeah. this big. No, and I, I think there isn't that much American culture that kind of jars with me anymore. The two that get me are adults cast as teenagers <laughs> and <Yeah>. gigantic houses. <laughs> Both of those things kind of jar with me, and I'm, I'm just being very British. <laughs> <laughs> but no, you um, that brought up a good point, and I don't know if it's, this is what you were feeling, but um, something I really like about Child's Play 2 is how it looks and feels different from the first one, and... Yeah. Uh, for Child's Play 2, the cinematography was done by uh, Stefan Chapsky, and he's worked on a bunch of films like uh, Edward Scissorhands and Batman Returns. And a strange connection I felt when I watched this a while back was I kept watching this and thinking, why does this remind me of Matilda? And it's the same cinematographer. And... He kind Good of u- he kind of uses the same techniques to put us in the world of Andy. How there's a lot of like wide, uh, wide angle lenses that make the rooms look sort of warped and freakishly big, and make Andy yeah. look really small in them. Because I yeah, there's a lot of wide uh, angle lenses in Matilda, like really close, you know, close uh, close ups of like people's faces. And they do that a lot in this film with like Chucky, and they it, the, the the wide angle lenses make Chucky look bigger in the room, doesn't it? Ah, uh, so maybe I've been kind of caught up in the cinematography. I, I'll be honest, I'm crap <laughs> at spotting good cinematography. So, <laughs> uh, well done for calling me out on that. But uh, yeah, that that's cool actually. It was a throwaway point and whining about my pokey little flat, but you've actually managed to find something sensible to say about it. Well done. No, ah! yeah, I think, well, I mean, maybe the houses were bigger, but like, I know exactly what you mean. There was a shot near the end, just after when the, the, the father dies and the uh, Grace, Zabis- uh, Grace Zabisky comes back from the orphanage to bring him, take him away. Mm. There's like, a, like, the camera is really close to like the side of Andy's head. And it's like going, looking upwards at like the stairs and like, you know, yeah. like the stairs and like, you can see up to like the top of the house and it looks massive. The house looks like a mansion, but it's just because it's like mm. this extreme wide angle lens. Yeah. Looking at, you talked about the death of the, the dad, the, uh, the foster dad. And there is some really creative deaths in this. But I do feel like the 15 rating is fair. None of it is exceptionally gory. Do you feel like aiming for a 15 rating actually makes them more creative here? Yeah, there's definitely a couple aspects to it that I was thinking. Like, yeah, it definitely is more bloodless. Like, he, the, the dad just breaks his neck. Grace Zabisky, she just gets stabbed, like, once. There, there was another really bloodless one. Yeah, the, the school teacher. The teacher. You, you, school, you teach, yeah. you don't see anything. She just gets beaten off screen, which, you know, it, it's it's an effective, they shoot it effectively, but yeah, it's completely yeah. bloodless. I th- but I think to some extent, there's almost more horror in the imagination of just how brutal and prolonged the beating of the teacher mm. is. It's really, really nasty. And even something like the photocopier, where the, the the face of the dead body comes out of the photocopier. That's gruesome as fuck, but it's not graphically bloody. And I wonder why. 
when it's clearly a horror film, they aimed for a 15 because it does feel like they aimed for a 15 rating. Yeah, it is strange that they didn't immediately slap it with an 18 just because it's, you know, a horror film and a sequel to uh, an 18 film. I would argue maybe they would, because they had a critically well-received horror film, they were trying to Mm. be like, don't worry, we're not going to go the way of like Friday the 13th. It's not going to just become a bloodbath. Which they did nine months later. Yeah, I mean, the films would, because they, they, the films would just, you know, go all in on that. But, like, there's still some disturbing kills in this. The, the, I found the, the smothering of the good guy assistant at the start. That was really quite yeah. disturbing. And then the... Again, it's not gory, but it's viscerally kind of upsetting. The guy who gets the uh, doll eyes implanted into his yes. eyes at the end... That's like, a, like, uh, that's a crazy, like, violent image. That yeah, and again, I think when you actually take a step back, the worst gore was the doll, and because it's a doll, because it's not human, they could get away with more and still retain a fifteen than if that level of gore had been done to a human. Yeah, they definitely. I guess I think they definitely consciously realized that because oh my god, like if we want to talk about the finale for a bit now, because I mean yeah. we have to talk about the finale because the finale technically goes on for like half an hour. It's like the entire third act. It's child's play, and and I'm all about the the, the prolonged <laughs> fucking finales. Good, and I think that was an important thing that they retained from the first one, and, and I'm glad they did. Because, yeah, I mean if you're considering the whole finale, where I listed all the sequences here, you got. Uh, yeah, I mean, so you have it basically starts when Kyle realizes that the Tommy doll is buried outside and that Chucky yeah. was real and Chucky is alive. And so you get that scene where she finds the mother dead and then she gets attacked and then she gets kidnapped by Chucky. So there's a whole car sequence with like the police officer where and then she like throws him out the windshield and then mm. she gets caught again and they go to the orphanage. And then that's when Grace Abisky dies. And then Chucky escapes onto the paper truck, the paper delivery truck with Andy. And that's, she's chasing after him. And that's like this, like chase sequence. And then they arrive at the toy factory. And even then within the toy factory, you've got several smaller sequences of like the voodoo sequence, which doesn't work. Yeah. And then Chucky realizes that he's just going to kill them. And you've got like the maze chase around all of uh, the, the 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 boxes, and then finally, finally, you get like the actual fin- you know the climax, which is them like yeah. fighting back and Chucky going through all the machinery, and even then, Chucky's uh, multiple deaths is so prolonged. Yeah, it's definitely an homage to the first one, doing the multiple deaths. But everything about this, it's so fast-paced and it's so intense. I love it. And there's so much interesting stuff in this prolonged finale. I looked up when Army of Darkness was. All right. And Army of Darkness was 1992, two years later than Child's Play 3. Did they nick the idea of the chainsaw hand from Charles Play 3 <laughs> in the knife hand. Probably not, but you can see where I'm coming from. I did like I did love his little knife hand. I mean, Chucky goes through I have a little uh, they made a Funko pop of that specific thing when he has the knife hand and the uh brilliant. His, his legs are missing and he's on the little uh, trolley cart. Like Chucky goes through Chucky is like mutating throughout this whole finale. And this is a testament to Brad Dorf's acting. I felt so bad for Chucky because Brad's screams of pain are so genuine. Yeah, yeah. And he is not just getting, like, stabbed or burnt. He is getting mutilated inside this factory machinery. I just have images of him in this sound booth, kind of (laughs) waving his arms and throwing his head back and just absolutely going all in. And that's so cool. I think that's... And a hugely important part of the Chucky franchise is how fucking good Brad Dourif is. I'm going to say it a hundred times on this podcast, and I don't care. No, yeah, he absolutely delivers in this finale, and again, it adds 
even if it is just him screaming in pain, it adds such an aspect that like other killers don't have. It, you know, it mm. reminds us that he is a human, a human being inside a doll. Yeah, and obviously, the, again, the the bleeding element as the doll becomes more fleshy, for want of a better word, sentient, human, uh, meaty, whatever <laughs> you want to say. I, I, I think that really adds to the kind of legend and canon of mm. what happens when you spend too long in the doll. And it's fucking gruesome. It's really fucking gruesome. And they get away with it because it's a doll. Exactly. I mean, they they have that little moment of suspense when that uh, liquid plastic almost lands on Andy's head. And then yeah. like, at that point when Chucky is promising to cut off Andy's legs and Andy... Uh, notices the uh, the hot plastic like valve that it, it's yeah. it reminded me of Home Alone just the way Chucky looks up and he's like oh no <laughs> well I think in Home Alone the number of concussions and deaths that those poor robbers would have actually had that's almost as bad as the number of deaths that Chucky has realistically Harry and Marv would have looked how Chucky did at the end of this movie <laughs> yep yeah, absolutely I have kind of said that the law is a bit vague when it comes to child's play. Mm, but yeah. <laughs> I think they did push the law a little bit with the whole, the ritual failed because he took too long. And that gives a sense of threat and timing for child's play three. That without what they established in this film, they couldn't have done in child's play three. So credit where credit's due, they do kind of add and flesh out the law a little so yeah, that's that, that's yeah. just me kind of <laughs> maybe perhaps retracting a little of what I said earlier. No, that that there is a good point. I do I did find that little twist in the finale a really good uh, addition to the tension because mm. yeah, one yeah you because know, once that fails, then like he doesn't need Andy. He's just like he's just going to kill Andy and probably horrifically kill Andy because of everything Andy's put Chucky through. So, and yeah. like, I, 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 it makes the ending genuinely, I f- was genuinely, even though I've seen this film several times, I, I'm, I still get genuinely tense at the moment where Andy is climbing up that little chute of all the rollers. And yes. they, have, they, they have that really good Foley work of where Chucky is climbing right behind his feet. And he's got like the knife in one hand. And he's just like slashing away on the roll of the metal rollers, and it's metal on metal. It's it's ge- yes. it's very tense. Yeah, and I like how he's a boy, and Kyle is an, nearly an adult, so she doesn't struggle as much as him. And I, and I really like how that kind of demographic is is real because you know I could climb a climbing wall better than a seven year old. <laughs> Even though I'm not particularly well trained, I'm taller, I'm stronger. And yeah, I think that the tension is done really well there. And it just yeah, I think they get it right basically. Yeah, there is a real tension to that. Like I know a rational part of me that knows like they're not gonna they're not gonna kill well that one, they're not gonna kill a child, but two, they're not gonna kill the main character at the end of the movie. Like they're in a film like no. this. But as you said, you know, these films, they always try to shy away from having actual kids in them. And it's, you know, when you put a kid in this environment, it's scary because they can't get away as easy. Yeah, and it's a different kind of horror. And I like that. The cliche is that the most of the people under threat would normally be about Kyle's age, whereas having a little boy is quite grim, actually. Yeah, it's it, it never goes as hard as that moment in Child's Play One when he's crying in the asylum and he's breaking down. Like that's really no. like, that's ho- that's just horrible to watch. But like in this, you know, again, it's you know he's a, he's a real, he's a real boy and he's going through all this trauma. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And they sort of they sort of play on that in Free as well, but. You know, then I, I feel, again, I feel like they made the mis- they they make the mistake of making him too mature in free, and it kind of yeah. lo- it, it loses this aspect. Yeah, I think you're right. I think you're right. But we'll, we'll look at that when we do Charles we will, Play Three yeah. next week. We can have a jolly old whinge about Charles, <laughs> <laughs> and I will. I know you will, and I'll defend it. 
spoilers for next week, everybody. <laughs> so I will say one tiny little point about like just just specifics about the doll and stuff. Like as you say, they like to keep it vague, but there are little odd specifics. They do this the same in the next mm. film as well, where you know how cool it is that the doll bleeds and you know Chucky is becoming more human. You have this cool opening of them rebuilding Chucky from start to finish. And there's a line yes. from the there's a line from the guy where he's like, Well, we checked it, we found absolutely nothing. That doll was definitely bleeding. <laughs> there is like blood and guts inside that doll. And they found nothing. <laughs> yeah, good point. And oh, they man. do the same thing again, I'll mention it. I mean, I'll mention it now because it's only a point, but in Child's Play, the opening of Child's Play 3, when like a little crane is moving what's left of Chucky and it's bleeding everywhere, no one is noticing this. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely <laughs> right. Can't be, uh, can't be ignored, I'm afraid. <laughs> yeah. And then, uh, the, you know, to connect to that point, the guy says they built it exactly, but you can see he has an open mouth with a little like teeth and a tongue. And that is not mm. how he looked in Child's Play One. He had like a closed mouth, <laughs> and it only when he yeah. became more re- only when he became more real that he could actually articulate his mouth. <laughs> yeah, and that's, I think that's the whole. As he gets more fleshy, as he gets more meaty, he but, kind of develops shit like tongues. Yeah, but then in this, they built him like that, and they were like, "Yeah, we built him exactly how he was in the first film." <laughs> like <laughs> they they made him more advanced. <laughs> I, I don't know. I think any horror film, if you look too hard, like we're kind of doing, <laughs> you can tear it to pieces. And that's not what horror's about. That is a good point. I mean, what's that? Oh, God, what's that Simpsons quote that I love? I always I always think of this when uh, fans of horror nitpick on the little films. When Marge goes, you know, Homer, it's very easy to criticise. And Homer interjects, fun too. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you and I are podcasters. We, we are <laughs> probably guilty of this. Uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, do you know, Dev, I've had such a lovely time chatting about Child's Play 2, which I think is underrated, and I don't definitely, think it deserves yeah. its 40% Rotten Tomatoes. Fuck you, critics. And, um, yeah, where can people find you? On the internet. Me, they can find me at Absolute Travis T on Twitter. And I believe on Twitter, you'll just find me other places. Uh, if you want to listen to my old Friday the 13th podcast, which I may be bringing back at some point in the future, it's Forever Friday on various surfaces. And uh, I just got a new computer, so I may be relaunching my uh, Twitch. Shoot that nebula. Uh, okay. I don't know when that's what you do on your Twitch. My Twitch, uh, what I was doing before I started full time work, and I had to postpone it a little bit and also get a new computer. I uh, pick a very dumb idea, like let's say uh, Scary Movie Six, and then okay. from the start of the month to the end of the month, I write that movie. <laughs> so that sounds equal parts amazing and ludicrous. It is, yeah. So um, you'll have. To <laughs> I did about a week and a half before my work started. So I basically had, um, I mapped out, you know, each act of Scary Movie Six and for of a plot. I, I'm going to be honest. I thought it was a, a decent plot. Uh, I I renamed it Scary Movie in Premises 2018, and then the <laughs> and then the subtitle was The Wayans Made Me Redo It. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> Love that. <laughs> so that's what I'm hopefully getting back into. Yeah, I think we'll obviously be able to update people as we go along because this podcast is going to be running for seven episodes. Then there's going to be like maybe a week's break before Chucky launches. So by the time Chucky launches, maybe you'll have uh, actually kind of got that set up and sorted and ready to go, man. I hope so. Uh, what, have, what have you got set up? What are you doing? Uh, I've so many podcasts i'm on loads of podcasts and i'll be as as concise as i possibly can if you like tattoos i've got a podcast about tattoos ink stories at ink stories pod on twitter and instagram if you're interested in stories about people's lives relating to naming ceremonies weddings and funerals i have a podcast based around my job as a humanist celebrant that's called life's milestones at life's milestones on twitter 
I have a podcast about Red Dwarf, the telly show that everyone should fucking love. That's at Red Dwarf Pod on Twitter, and it's called Shipwrecked and Comatose if you're looking for that. And I kind of peer on Podcast 616 a lot, which is our network's podcast about the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And I also have a podcast about kids' telly where my friend and I show each other our kids' telly from different generations. And one of them sits there and goes, isn't it great? And the other one sits there and goes, that was shite. So if you're interested in kind of like rose-tinted glasses versus realistic opinions on kids' telly, that's called Right in the Childhood, at RITC Pod on Twitter. And breathe. <laughs> So thank you so much for joining us on this episode of Chucky Vision. And we will be back next week to talk about Child's Play 3. So until next time, wanna play? Chucky Vision is a podcast brought to you by the We Made This Network. Follow us on Twitter at Chucky Vision. Follow the network on Twitter at WMT underscore network. Our website is we made this network.com. The logo was designed by Dev and the theme tune composed by Dark Fantasy Studios. Wanna play? Hello everyone, this is Tony, Network Chief of We Made This. As you know, our podcast network brings together a brilliant assortment of talent who talk about all kinds of pop culture content, such as the episode you just listened to. We're not going anywhere, but we'd love to keep the lights on for even longer if you're able to support our network on Patreon. For just £2 a month, you get your name in lights and the satisfaction of knowing you're helping us produce more great audio. And for £3 a month, you'll get your name in lights, but you'll also get access to an exclusive bi-monthly podcast from the We Made This Talent Pool on podcasting, pop culture, and, well, you tell us. We'll take your suggestions. For less than the price of a coffee per month, you can help keep We Made This going. Just head to patreon.com forward slash we made this, that's P A T R E O N dot com forward slash We Made This and get the ball rolling. Elsewhere on We Made This. Pick a disc. The, cor- the chorus feels like it's um, improvised as well. It's Whereas improvised, like... but I also think it's, it's like respect because everybody gets a shout out. Busta Rhymes in effect. Shahid is in effect. Five Dog is in effect. And it, it ends, I think, towards the end. I, actually, I know, towards the end. Who's in the house? Ron Carter is in the house. So uh, I kind of think of it, uh, oh, this is going to be very professorial sounding, but if you write a research paper and, you know, you put all your citations of your sources. Yeah. The, it's all the citations. These are all the, these are all the folks that made this come together. <laughs> He's, he's reading. He's reading the Wikipedia footnotes for this song, isn't he? So, like exactly. 30, twenty years before it came in effect and stuff. Make it so, a Star Trek Picard podcast. To your theory, Gene Roddenberry, one of his golden rules was that conflict always had to be external, right? Like it couldn't be internal. You couldn't have, uh, you know, the main drama being between the two people on the show it always had to be humanity fighting outward because we were already connected and and we had already mm, resolved most of those issues right and as trek has evolved and we've started to incorporate many of the real life drama that can occur between actual people uh, which i think it's it's made the show all the better for it yeah but i think you're on to something right in the childhood the big thing is raven has a vision that the job she was going for she didn't get because the woman says to raven's vision i don't hire black people terrible like we cringe that's just the fact that it was done with 
the actor playing the racist job yeah, assistant Chloe. did it with real venom and the kind of she did it throughout everything though like it she was, was horrible she was she was not so subtle with how she felt about black people Chelsea couldn't pick up on it check out all of these shows and more on the We Made This podcast network mm-hmm.